So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. So um, as Juan said, I want to tell you about, about topological modular forms, and I want to talk to, tell you about supersymmetric quantum field theories. Um, and just to say, uh, well, I'll give somehow the, I want to kind of give away the game, give away the punchline of, of the, or the motivational belief that, that, that's motivating quite a lot of the talk, um, which is that, that in the case, the, the motivating belief, so I didn't line this up correctly. So the motivating belief is that these are supposed that some version of TMF and some version of SQFT are related. Well, what do I mean by SQFT? The specific thing I mean that I will mean here is um, one plus one dimensional, minimally supersymmetric SQFTs. And the what TMF is, it stands for topological modular forms. And um, I won't say much about the mathematics of TMF in this talk, but it's a, a universal version of elliptic cohomology. And the history of the subject went that um, people, including in particular some papers of Edwards, um, about two-dimensional supersymmetry were what motivated the mathematicians to invent elliptic cohomology altogether. And now it's coming back, hopefully. So that's the, the, the background. But I want to start, or I actually want to, that's sort of, well, anyway, that's in the back of my head. So the, the general context of what I want to tell you about is um, a general question that I think lots of people have contemplated versions of. There's a, a general question which I'm going to phrase in a very underdefined way. The question is um, classify quantum field theories up to deformation. Or if you're a mathematician, maybe I mean something slightly stronger than that. Um, a mathematician might actually ask something slightly more. I might ask, um, calculate the, the homotopy of the space of quantum field theories. And um, this is very underdefined the way I phrased it. I should tell you, to, to make this at all a, a sensible question, I need to tell you all sorts of extra things about what I have in mind for this type of space. So, so what I should really tell you is, is, of course, I need to tell you, makes sense. At the minimum, I need to tell you a, a bit more, like I should tell you, for instance, what dimension I'm working in. I should tell you, um, for instance, how many supersymmetries I care about. And can you see this, by the way, with the podium? But you can see it down to here so far. OK. Um, and, and I also should tell you all sorts of, of, of you know, even this isn't, isn't enough to make this a good space to talk about its homotopy. So I should tell you some analytic questions. I should tell you um, some analytic questions about, about um, which QFTs are allowed, are analytically allowed. And, and the most important one maybe is, is um, which deformations are allowed. I'm sorry? 
Well, let me give an example. Let me, um, so eventually, I've already told you the, the first two questions for the case I care about. Eventually, eventually, I care about the case where this is two total dimensions and where I have one supersymmetry. But I'll warm up with some lower dimensional, fewer supersymmetries in lower dimensional case. Um, what do I mean by analytically allowed? So, so by analytically allowed, I mean the following. So for me, and you're allowed to ask some other question. I think Nazi's interested in a very different answer to the following question. But for me, um, I want what I'm going to call what I'm going to call compact SQ. Maybe supersymmetric, but quantum field theories. I don't have a precise mathematical definition of compact away from zero plus one dimensions, but the idea of compact, okay, first of all, I only care about everything in the world for me is going to be unitary. And, and for me, compactness is some sort of spectral condition, is that this is a spectral condition. So for example, in 0 plus 1D, um, 0 plus 1D quantum field theory, well, what is a 0 plus 1D quantum field theory? It has, it's just maybe a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian. And the, so a 0 plus 1D quantum field theory is compact if the um, Wick rotated time evolution operator is, maybe I should call this tau, for Wick rotated time, um, is trace class for all positive real numbers. So this, this forces the spectrum of the Hamiltonian not to, so f first of all, this forces the Hamiltonian to have, this is some weak version of gapped, so it forces the spectrum to, have dis to be discrete with finite eigenvalues. And it also prevents too much piling up at infinity of the spectrum. So this is, this is slightly stronger than um, that H should have compact resolvent. I realize that I'm a mathematician speaking to a physics crowd, so you might not care about the subtleties of, of analytic trace class. That the trace should converge. Yeah. So, the, so in particular, I'm asking that the partition function, that the Wick rotated partition function, should be a, a just a well-defined, absolutely convergent thing. You shouldn't have to think about what it means to talk about the partition function. Sorry. And then I well, and then I, again, I want to emphasize that in above zero plus one d, I don't know exact. I don't. I don't claim to know exactly what I mean by compact. Certainly, a well-defined partition function would be part of compactness, but maybe there's sort of a more local version that I should ask for, and I don't know what the answer is. Um, and the reason why I want to emphasize compactness is because this, this type of, of compact theory, yeah, so one more, one more piece of, of motivational of ideas that, that um, that sigma models with compact target whatever compactness means it should at least admit sigma models with compact target yes or or sigma models with non compact target if the potential grows fast enough and what i don't know is the details of that speed I mean, a, a potential that grows very slowly at infinity will not be compact. Presumably, at a minimum, you want to, if you compact your parameter filter, you get a compact theory. That, that's absolutely the minimum that I would require, and I don't know if that's enough. My, my, my guess is I want to ask something slightly stronger than that, but I don't know how to phrase it. Oh, it's the wrong board. So the last thing I want to say is about what, what type of deformations I want to allow. And again, in the 0 plus 1D case, 
the modulized space I'm imagining is the space of, of quantum mechanics models with this analytic condition. And that space is known how to topologize it. And so I'm going to try to reproduce a topology like that. So the types of allowed deformations that I want to allow So this is, in mathemati you know, the mathematician, I would say, by w when I say which, which deformations, I'm actually, actually asking um, what topology am I putting on this space. So some allowed deformations that I want to, some types of deformations I want to allow, I certainly want to allow being able to, to you know, deform by adding an operator, by any operator, marginal, relevant, irrelevant, I don't care. Um, and this might open and close gaps. My spectral condition means that my Hamiltonian has some weak version of gapedness, but, but uh, condensed matter theorists might care about keeping the bands apart. And I'm not going to ask that. That's a very interesting topology. It's not the topology I care about. And, um, Well, there might be some irrelevant operators that keep this trace class condition. Um, I'm certainly allowed to, to take our, you know, f um, flow up and down. Along RG flow lines, RG flow up and down. Well, let me say it this way. I want to put an equivalence relation on field theories called deformation equivalence. If you know what it means to flow down, then I'm telling you that a theory is, should be equivalent to what you, anything it gets from flowing down. So flowing up is whatever that generates. Now, I'm not telling you whether flowing up is a well-defined thing. In, some, in, in, in the cases that I've tried to axiomatize, flowing, like there is a well-defined um, group action called RG flow. There's what's not a well-defined, what's not a one-to-one -one thing is going all the way to the far IR limit along RG flow. So for instance, in the quantum mechanics case, RG flow just rescales the time parameter, which is to say it rescales the Hamiltonian. That's a perfectly well-defined group action. Now you could ask what happens when you flow to the far IR or the far UV. So imagine we're quantum mechanics. Yes. Um, I'm, I, I cannot do um, spectral calculus live, so I can't, on the top of my head, tell you if that deformation keeps me in this trace class condition. I think you should do it all Okay, the, then the answer is yes, it's an allowed deformation. But it changes <laughs> the asymptotic behavior of the potential. All I ask is that it preserve this. Are you allowed to bring space? Another way of asking is, are you allowed to bring space from Yes, so you're asking, so in, in fact, when I'm axiomatizing quantum mechanics models for me, um, my quantum mechanics models um, have always have infinitely many states, have infinitely many um, eigenvectors at infinity. So in fact, if you ask me for the details, I'll tell you that for me, a uh, quantum mechanics model is a Hilbert space with an operator on it which is, has, um, which is self adjoint on the closure of its domain, but the closure of its domain should be of infinite co-dimension in the whole Hilbert space. The last sentence is key. Thank you. Okay. If I'm in the supersymmetric quantum mechanics, yes. deformations like this can change the existing space. No, I don't believe you. Right.
I think if you stay in the world, in the, if you stay in the space of, of models where the, the um, trace class condition is, like the, the index is among other things just the trace of, like it's some version of the trace of this trace class operator. As long as, and it's an integer value thing, as long as you're staying in the space of things where that's a well-defined thing, and you need to arrange the topology, so you still have to do some things to arrange the topology to make sure it can't jump in really weird ways. But it won't jump unless, it, unless you pass through something where it's not defined. Okay. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to revise. I, I want to, like, whatever, I want to work in a world where, for instance, the index is a well-defined invariant. And I think that I've said the axioms correctly for that to be true. I haven't actually told you the topology in this space. I, okay, the topology I want to work in is this um, strong convergence of the resolvent and um, with the strong operator topology on the space of Hilbert spaces. And I believe that when I say those two words, then the index is a uh, homotopy invariant. So, in fact, I think that the index is a homotopy invariant, even if I work in the slightly larger space where H has compact resolvent. I don't think I need as strong a condition as I've put. So, so I just don't believe your objections. I mean, we can investigate them. But. Um, anyway, so I want to say I want to allow RG flows up and down. I, I, I want to allow um, passing to the far IR as an allowed deformation. So in particular, that means that any two theories for me, if they agree in the far IR, I'm going to consider them deformation equivalent. Now most compact theories, if you, try to, if you tried to flow to the far UV, you'd leave the world of compact theories. So I don't, I don't ask that, but, you know, and the far UV if it converges. Um, and then I think that if I'm paraphrasing Nazi correctly, I think Nazi would have called these the hep th deformations. And Nazi might have called this the con mat deformation. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm not paraphrasing you correctly. So this is the type of space I, I want to consider. And so before I get to the, the one I really care about, let me just remind very briefly as a, as a sort of a warm-up what's going on in, um, in 0 plus 1D. And it gives me a chance to also talk about two slightly different spaces that I haven't yet tried to distinguish. So in 0 plus 1D, I want to remind something that, that was from kind of maybe an undergraduate quantum mechanics textbook. Um, and, you know, I'm a mathematician, so the last physics course I took was undergraduate quantum mechanics. So, um, so I want to recall that from, from undergraduate quantum mechanics that, that there were in your quantum mechanics textbook two slightly different descriptions of what a quantum mechanics model was. So in your quantum mechanics textbook, you you read that there was such a thing as the Schrodinger picture. So I might talk about the, the space of Schrodinger picture quantum mechanics models. And up to these, que these important questions about, that are functional analytic in nature about, about the details of, of the allowed spectra of the Hamiltonians, uh, Schroding Schrodinger picture quantum mechanics model was um, an element in this space was a Hilbert space um, together with a Hamiltonian, satisfying some, some good analytic conditions. And then, um, and that's what it is. And that was as opposed to what you might have called the Heisenberg picture model. And what we all know is the Heisenberg picture is a slightly more physical because there's something slightly non-physical about the information in a Hilbert space. It has slightly too much information because the physical information doesn't see a U1 
a global U1 action on the Hilbert space. And so the Heisenberg picture model was supposed to correct that. An element in the Heisenberg picture was um, an associative algebra and a Hamiltonian, where the associative algebra is supposed to be a, well, it's supposed to be isomorphic to the bounded operators on a Hilbert space, but, but not canonically. And, and the correct math way to say that is that, that, that A is a, um, a type 1 von Neumann factor. And then, still in the absence of any supersymmetry, you can ask what's the, what's the homotopy type of these two spaces? And the homotopy type of, well, the, without any supersymmetry, um, The homo there's the space of Hamiltonians is just contractible. You can, in my space, with my spectral condition, I can still gap all, everything off to infinity. So the, the space of, of Hamiltonians is contractible. And the space of Hilbert spaces is the classifying space for the infinite unitary group. And in the strong operator topology, that's also contractible. So the space of Heisenberg picture, of Schrodinger picture models in my definition is, is actually a contractible space. On the other hand, the space of Heisenberg picture models, again, there's no homotopy here. The, the data of the Hamiltonian is no homotopy at all. But the space of type 1 factors, well, every type 1 factor is abstractly isomorphic to every other type 1 factor. So this is a classifying space for a group, namely the group of automorphisms of a type 1 factor. The group of autom so this is, as I said, this is the classifying space of the automorphism groups of a type 1 factor. And the automorphism group of a type 1 factor is not the unitary group, but the projective unitary group. And the projective unitary group is not contractible in the strong operator topology. The projective unitary group has the homotopy, has a z in degree 2, and so this classifying space has a z in degree 3. Yes. I don't know what a two-level system is. Okay, and I'm going to add infinitely many eigenvalues at infinity. Great. Okay. No, because I'm not. Because remember, I'm always allowed to bring in states from infinity and send states off to infinity. I, my, my Hilbert spaces are always infinite dimensional because my, my, uh, my parenthetical axiom was the requirement that, um, that I have infinitely many modes at infinity that I can grab one at any time. There's no homotopy in the space at infinity because, again, that's an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. An infinite <coughs> at infinite energy, yes, at infinite eigenvalue for the Hamiltonian, at, at plus infinity. Um, or another way to say this is that in the strong, in the compact resolvent to, like in the, strong convergence of the resolvent topology. Um, your two Hilbert, your, your space with two, two eigenvalues, for instance, um, there's a family that sends one of those off to infinity. And in the compact resolvent topology, that'll converge to the just having one eigenvalue. So that's, that is an allowed deformation in my space. Now that's getting rid of one object, but you also allow for Well, sure. Deformation equivalence is an equivalence relation. But no, I mean, yeah, there's, if you want, there's a family of 3D models that converges to your favorite 2D model. But then if you go back to the index, what about the definition that sends the bound space to infinity? Um, it, I don't have fields in my model. I only have a Hilbert space. So I don't quite understand the question. Yes. And I mean, I didn't write on the board sort of all sorts of math words, but I, I can write them. I mean, I want to apologize. Um, so that the Hamiltonian, um, I want to apologize the Hamiltonian 
with the topology of compact result of um, strong convergence, the strong convergence of the resolvent. So that's some specific topology on the space of, uh, of unbounded operators. And Let's go back to the harmonic operator. Yeah. And I say the epsilon, which is a small parameter, that says that it's true to the set. Okay. It's true that for arbitrary it's no Um Again, I can't do these on the board. I would have expected that I was allowed to add a Q to the 10th per, um, deformation continuously. But I, I can't do it on the board. I believe that I can, but I cannot do it live on the board. I mean, if, if you have a, de a deformation that brings, that sort of sends the, the, the potential de back down very low at infinity, that will typically not be a continuous deformation in my space. If your deformation, if your Hamiltonian stays very large, then sure. That will typically be continuous. Uh, but, yeah. yeah. Now I give a one over epsilon to the power of the Well, I think that we should um, actually work it through after the talk and see what happens. Anyway, the reason I wanted to bring up this, this 0 plus 1D example was to say that, that um, the Schrodinger picture, okay, what do I want to say? I want to say that this, this space, so what, it, what we already have is we have um, the space of, uh, the Heisenberg picture is a more physical picture. So what we have is a space of all quantum mechanics models that I care about. And it, well, it has the homotopy type of KZ3. And um, I want to suggest that this KZ3, this is the home for, for its fifth anomalies in, in 0 plus 1D. And so what we're finding in this no supersymmetric case, and the, the, the Schrodinger picture, this is somehow the, this is like modeling kind of non-anomalous quantum mechanics models. And so what we're finding in the absence of any supersymmetry is that, which is sort of expected, is that, um, is that in the without supersymmetry, the space of non-anomalous models is actually a contractible space. The space of all models, rather, mapping to, to the corresponding anomalies um, is a homotopy equivalence. So what we're finding in this very low dimensional example is that the only homotopical information in the space is something about anomalous. Absolutely. So, so my, like I, I'm talking about the space of all theories. I can certainly use it to study the space of theories with any symmetry that you want because that would be some point in that space with that symmetry. Um, what I told you here about the automorphism group is telling you that what it means to have a symmetry on a Heisenberg picture model and what it means to have a symmetry here are different. A symmetry here would have to be a um, group acting on the Hilbert space preserving, with the Hamil preserving the Hamiltonian. A symmetry here would be a group acting on the von Neumann algebra preserving the Hamiltonian. And then you can ask, given a group acting on the, Hamilt on the von Neumann algebra, what does it mean, you know, what's the obstruction to lifting it to a Hilbert space action? That is the Atuft anomaly. And so, yes, you can, I mean, any, your favorite example of an anomalous theory. So um, the Klein 4 group has lots of actions that are, has a, you can write down an action with an anomaly, for instance, that's mixed between the two, the two Z2s. So that was the first conclusion. I want to very quickly add a little bit of, I want to add some fermions in the game first. This whole story is still without supersymmetry. It's easy enough to add some fermions, and the only reason I want to say it is because that calculation changes. So I could have perfectly well talked about fermionic theories and said the word super Hilbert space 
And then I wouldn't have BU infinity. I would have had BU infinity bar infinity, but that's still contractible. So there's no information there. And I could have perfectly well said the word type 1 von Neumann factor, type 1 von super von Neumann factor. And now this all changes because there's actually two different super von Neumann factors up to isomorphism. And the whole homotopy group has a, a, Z, in degree, a Z2 in degree 0, a Z2 in degree 1, and, a Z2, and a, still a Z in degree 3. Um, and I write this up just to flag that, that the Z2 in degree, so there's, there's actually two components. of this space. And this you should think of as some sort of, um, so this is, this part is, is recognized in the literature under the name kind of, this is sort of a home for Gu Wen super cohomology. So it's, it's no, it's sort of well known to be a home for anomalies of fermionic theories. And this in this dimension is a sort of gravitational So that's all well and good, but that's not really what I care about. What I care about is the case with supersymmetry. So what I care about is the case with supersymmetry. So you can say the same words with, with say, one supersymmetry. I'm going to keep working in the quantum mechanics case just to finish the story. So in the case with supersymmetry, the major difference is that, that you no longer have um, a contractible space of supersymmetry operators. So for example, it's, as, I've, as we've been discussing already, I want to, maybe I didn't do it right, but I'm pretty sure I did. I think I've arranged the topology so that for the space of, of non-anomalous theories, so the Schrodinger picture, so the non-anomalous, I'll say Schrodinger picture, anyway, the space of, Hamil of Hilbert spaces together with a supersymmetry operator, has a very famous um, z-valued invariant called the index. And this is actually a surjection, so every index is realized. And so this shows you that this space, um, that it shows you that even the space, so let's call this, I'm going to start giving, yeah, so this shows you that the space, that this space is definitely not contractible. And if you think about the space of all models, including these kind of slightly anomalous ones, you get a graded space graded by the, the anomaly. So the space of, maybe I'll call it SQM, of all possibly anomalous, maybe I could call them Heisenberg picture. Um, N equals one SQM models. Well, it's graded by forgetting the supersymmetry, just remembering the anomaly. By this, this, hum, this um, space with two components. So in particular, it has, a, it has two pieces to it. And um, in fact, um, this, this two-component space is, uh, provides a model for, the, for the, what's called KU, the complex K-theory spectrum. So that tells you all of the homotopy groups. This is a very well-studied object in mathematics. So now I can return to my my motivation. So our motivating hypothesis is that the same, that a similar story about supersymmetric quantum mechanics and K-theory holds one dimension up in dimension two.
So our motivating hypothesis is the following. So what do we, what do we have? So there's some space. I'll write, um, I'll just write SQFT bullet for the space, which I want to emphasize if there are any mathematicians in the audience that I don't claim to have a definition of this space. And if there aren't, then you don't care. But um, the space of, of minimally supersymmetric, so n equals 0, 1, 1 plus 1d SQFTs, compact. Well, what we definitely have is we definitely have an anomaly map. There's a, a map to the fermionic um, 1 plus 1d quantum field theories. And just as in the quantum mechanics case, one should expect, but I don't think we have any sort of idea of a proof for this, but I think it's reasonable to expect, and I think Nati has also conjectured, that, that in the absence of any supersymmetry, this space should have, the only homotopy invariant should be the anomaly. So that, that this should be homotopy equivalent to the space of anomalies. And for fermionic theories in 2D, we understand the space of possible anomalies. There's uh, a z in degree 0. I'll, I'll just list the homotopy groups. So there's a, a z in degree 0. There's a z2 in degree 1. There's a z2 in degree 2. And there's a z in degree 4, and that's it. And this z in degree 0 is what really deserves the name of gravitational anomaly. So a an, uh, theory in 0D, if you have a conformal field theory in, in, sorry, in 1 plus 1 dimensions, then it has two central charges. And, um, and you can combine them into a, the, right tape, the difference of the right and left central charges. And even if you're not conformal, this difference is still a well-defined number. And it's always a half integer. So twice this difference is, is a z, and that's the, the parameter that's controlling the z in the bottom degree. And our motivating hypothesis is um, this is what's being called kind of extended supercohomology, if that's a, if that's a meaningful phrase for you. Okay. So this Z2 tells you if you have a symmetry, maybe you have a, um, there might be something kind of where the symmetry actually doesn't take your theory to itself, but takes your theory to it, your, that theory tensored with the ARF invariant theory. Um, and this Z2 is a kind of um, measures whether you can actually get your theory to act on the Ramon Hilbert space or whether it's projective on the Ramon Hilbert space. And this Z is the ordinary digraph Witten um, term in the anomaly. So, I, I have an earlier thought when you said that there's a time when you did say it goes back to one step, but one time in the time of SQFT, you have a deeply volume invariant. Absolutely, that's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that in my, in the, in my imagined space, there are, I'm allowing a one parameter family that takes my theory. So, because I'm this, you know, in this sort of whatever the two dimensional version of Heisenberg picture is, it should be about like something about the, the local operators of the theory. The local operators of a theory are blind to tensoring your theory with the ARF theory. So that means that it, you can't rule out the idea that maybe there's a one parameter family that takes your, your um, theory and at the end of the family really came back to your theory tensored with the ARF theory. Those are the same point in this anomalous, in this space. But if I tried to realize them more concretely, I might pick up that there was that ARF invariant showing up.
first one, you have the up and down because you have the turn Yeah. But there might also be other symmetries, might be double symmetries. So you yes. limit yourself to that dimension that's reserved for double symmetry. I, I've been talking about the space of all field theories, and I um, I mean, imagine my, my, my belief when I'm talking about this space is that if you want to ask me about the space of theories with symmetry group G, that would be the, the space of maps into this space from the classifying stack of G. And so understanding the homotopy of this space, understanding the full homotopy of this space would, up to sort of the type of hard calculations that homotopy theorists are good at, would in principle tell you the homotopy of the space of theories with symmetry group SU2 or the space of theories with symmetry group whatever. So for instance, kind of this, the gravitational anomaly itself tells you that this space has only, has Z components. But if I had a Z2 symmetry group that I was acting on, it might probe this Z2. And so I'd get some, you know, components that measured both from here and from here. And in fact, from all of these. Absolutely. So is that a term in the theory parameterized by the circle? Right. So for example, a theory, a theory parameterized by the circle is in the kind of worlds of homotopy theory the same as a theory with a Z symmetry. Now if you if you arrange a stricter notion of the space of quantum field theories, those might be different. But in the, as a homotopy theorist, S1 is the same as a Z symmetry, an S1 family. Well, I don't know what sense you guys call it. Up to, say, replacing my theory with a deformation equivalent one, absolutely. So any given S1 family might not really be a symmetry in that sense on the origin of the S1 family. But I could replace the origin of that S1 family with a deformation equivalent theory, which would support a Z symmetry. And I could use that S1 family to arrange that Z symmetry. So up to replacing theories by deformation equivalents, yes, I claim they're the same. Um, I'm not going to have a lot of time, so should I continue on? I'm happy to just talk about this part, but, but this isn't sort of the most exciting part of what we did. So the motivating assumption for us Um, and I think I'll just sort of tell you the assumption and then I'll tell you what results we got from, from studying it. The motivating, the motivating hypothesis, maybe, I should call it, in, is that, um, that this object of, that of physical interest, the space of SQFTs, is equivalent to an object in mathematics called TMF. And that this equivalence is, there's an equivalence of, of the infinity ring spectra. If you don't know what an infinity ring spectrum is, that doesn't matter. I just wanted to put the words on in case you did. Um, and uh, the reason why this is a useful hypothesis is in two directions. So if in physics, this is useful because the mathematicians, the, the mathematicians have calculated a lot about TMF. For example, we know, um, we pretty much know all of its homotopy groups. We don't know everything about it, but we know a lot about it. So it's useful in, the hypothesis is useful in physics because it, it makes predictions, actual predictions about this space by saying, uh, you go and look at what's known about CMF and you use them to make predictions. On the other hand, it's useful in mathematics because um, hopefully we will have an analytic definition of SQFT. But um, TMF so far, um, this does not have an analytic definition. Yet. It all, it's only constructions of mathematics have been highly homotopy algebraic and very intense. Um, and so the, one of the reasons for this, this program is that hopefully we can eventually have an analytic definition of what a quantum field theory is and then use the space of quantum field theories as a model 
to, uh, like to provide a definition for TM. Um, and the, better than just the hypothesis, so there's an index from SQFTs that lands in modular forms. It's a famous modular form valued index of a, of a zero one theory. And there's also a well known map from TMF, and the hypothesis is that, that these maps are the same. And that helps um, nail down the equivalence. So let me mention some of these predictions. So, for instance, Oh, and so most of what I've been doing is I've been sort of going into the mathematics literature and finding what's known about the homotopy groups of TMF and using those to make predictions about physics. And then we can try to test those predictions, and that would give evidence if we succeed. It gives evidence for the hypothesis. So, so for example, um, it's known – so what I want to say is the following. What you can read off directly from the construction of the index of a quantum field theory is, is it sort of automatic from the construction that the index of some, some, S, some 0, 1 SQFT, um, what's automatic is that it's an integer val – it's a modular form. Let's suppose that this has um, gravi uh, has degree n, then it's a modular form of weight n on 2 with integer um, – so this is – this is the weight, and this means um, integer Q expansion. And you can get a little better than that. Um, No, just integer. I mean integer. There could be negative numbers. This is a super object. This is a signed count of things, so it could certainly have signs. Um, and, and I think physicists might object that I'm off by I'm, – I'm some, some, there's some normalizing factor that, that's a power of Dedekind zeta. So the, the index that Edward originally wrote down was, was – had an interesting um, multiplier under the T transformation that depends on the gravitational anomaly. And you can correct that by, by multiplying by some powers of eta to correct that, and that changes the, the weight of the modular form, and it matches better with what the mathematicians do. But from the, from the hypothesis – see, from the hypothesis, um, actually the, the map – so we know – let me say it this way um, – the map from topological modular forms of weight n to integer modular forms of degree n. There's this horrible thing that, that this is homotopical degree and this is the weight of the modular form and there's this a factor of two you have to accommodate um, – is known not to be a subjection. And so that – um, the failure of this to be a suggestion should constrain the possible values of the index. So not every index can be realized as the index of an SQFT if the hypothesis is correct. And so for – Yes, that's right. I mean, you, they're, they're not completely obvious, but in the case of sigma models, so – see. There's a space of, of manifolds with appropriate um, – with what's called a string structure, which is what you need to cancel some anomaly. And there's – you can take the sigma model, and there's also known to be a map to TMF. And um, the constructions are already known that these two compositions agree. And so the, the hypothesis is that, that – Kind of the sigma model is what the homotopy theorists know how to do. But yes, you can read it off from just facts about divisibility of Eisenstein series in the case of sigma models. Um, but so the example I want to mention – I'm not going to get any time. So the example I want to mention is that, that for example, um, 
the um, delta itself is not in the image. But, but 24 delta is. And so, so this led us to a search. So this suggests an interesting problem. Uh, delta is just, um, sorry, delta is just the, 20, the 24th power of Dedekind eta. Remember, I'm sort of using the weight of the modular form to, to remember the homotopical degree. This is just the modular discriminant. This is the thing that you invert to actually get periodic modular forms. I don't remember who asked. Um, so this suggests an interesting problem, which is, so more generally, um, k delta to the d is in the image if and only if 20, um, k times d is, is in 24z. And suggests an interesting problem that I invite you guys to try. Interesting problem. Which is to engineer um, SQFTs with some with sort of specific ind specific indexes, small but non-zero. Indexes. Turns out that when you try to engineer an SQFT, typically you'll just get zero index, and so to get non-zero index at all is hard. And then when you've done that, it tends to be very large. So I won't say more than that, but I, we we had some work on that. The other prediction that I promised in my abstract. Um, yes. Ah, where do modular forms come from? So. Um, these are, are from, well, I, I haven't told you what CMF is, so I won't, but from the physics side, uh, an SQFT is in particular, uh, well, it's a, a one plus one dimensional quantum field theory, and, so I c and it's unitary, so I can Wick rotate it to a Euclidean signature theory. And then after Wick rotation, I get a, uh, I get a 2D Euclidean signature. Um, still supersymmetric field theory. And then the, um, the index itself is the partition function on um, a two torus with um, periodic, periodic spin structure. It's called sort of odd spin structure. And so the modularity is just coming from the fact that it's the t from, the from the two torus itself. No. Um, so the right moving supersymmetry in this spin structure means that there's no tau bar dependence. So, so just from the fact that it's a partition function on a two torus, it's, it's a function of tau and tau bar. But the supersymmetry, there's a sort of standard argument that says that there's no tau bar dependence from supersymmetry. Uh, the prediction is that there should exist um, super symmetric, so su super quantum field theories in this dimension. Of, yeah, so the prediction is so the prediction is that um, it's two things. So the first part of the prediction is that if um, if you have uh, super quantum field theory, let's say that I'm just in, like, so let me just talk about it, for instance, with 1, 1 theories. So a 1, 1 theory, the index will just be a power of delta from, this, from the second supersymmetry. So let's say f is a, a 1, 1 SQFT. For instance, maybe it's totally topological on one side with um, c right minus c left a multiple of 12. If it doesn't have a multiple of 12, then they're just the index will be zero automatically. Um, then the index of f will live in um, 24 divided by the GCD of 24 and d z, and further that this bound is saturated. Uh, 
uh, just some number. If it's the gravitational anomaly divided by 12, because if it's not divisible by 12, then the index is just going to vanish for a 1 1 theory automatically. So I might as well work in that degree. Yeah, I mean, the 1 1 symmetry means the index is an integer up to some normalizing factor. So if you want, I could write it up to kind of the discriminant to the dth power to normalize it. And so it's an interesting problem to try to find theories with this index and maybe see if there's, maybe the prediction's wrong. Maybe there's theories that, that aren't in this space. So I'm going to have no more time. Okay, sorry. So the, I'll just say very quickly the, another prediction that we tested that comes from this hypothesis. So another prediction from this hypothesis is that if you take the S3 sigma model, So the prediction, and I think more or less a theorem by now, well, if, and this is um, mine, Davide Gallotto's, and, and combining work of mine with Gallotto and with, with Witten, um, is that the S3 sigma model, so to tell, to in minimal supersymmetry, to give you a sigma model, I have to give you a little bit more information to, to control an anomaly. So um, I'll say with string structure equals decay. Um, yeah, sorry, thank you. With k units of h flux um, is deformation equivalent to one to one with spontaneous supersymmetry breaking. If and only if k is divisible by 24. Yeah, sorry, the 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 zero one sigma model. Yes. Um, oh yeah, sure. I'll say level k. So that's the prediction, and it's what we were basically able to show. And I won't say anything about the proof because I'm supposed to end it in one minute. But I'll tell you one step in the proof. Which is the following. So the step goes as follows. So the, the one, one, one ingredient. is that we argue that if, if you have a theory um, as c right minus c left, twice c right minus c left in 4k minus 1, um, and if you have a, a way to deform it to one with spontaneous supersymmetry breaking with a, a a sort of path in the space of SQFTs to, to one with SUSY breaking, um, then from the data of that path, I can give you uh, an SL, a real analytic, let's see, I can give you a function f hat of tau and tau bar, which is um, SL2Z modular, but it's, it's not holomorphic, um, but solves a holomorphic anomaly equation that the square root of minus 8 um, you met tau 2, this is the imaginary part of tau, df hat d tau bar is the um, one point function of the Susy symmetry generator and furthermore yeah 
Uh, one less than a multiple of four. Is that same no. Sorry. Um, let me call, yeah. And finally, that, um, that this function, if you take the kind of Q expansion of this function, so what does that mean? You write down the limit as tau bar goes to minus infinity of f hat. That's still a function of tau. This has integral Q expansion. And it's not quite integral, it's up to some explicit correction. That I'm not going to tell you about. It's related to the mod 2 index, but it's something explicit and usually zero. And so if you have a null homotopy, then you can produce a function solving this, these two, these properties. And so on the other hand, um, given the one point function, you can measure, given the one point function of the supersymmetry, generator. Maybe I'll call this the, the one-point function of the supersymmetry generator. Um, given the one-point function of the supersymmetry generator, you can measure the obstruction to being able to solve these equations. And that obstruction lives somewhere very explicit. It lives in the power series with complex-valued coefficients quotiented by the power series with z-valued coefficients plus the modular forms of weight um, to c right minus c left plus 1. No, of weight c right minus c left plus a half. Um, and this has lots of room for torsion invariance. And so this is where this has lots of torsion. And so we have this explicit, um, and, and the final statement is that this obstruction as a class in this space is a deformation invariant. This. So I'm, I'll stop because I'm over time, but this gives us a deformation, a torsion value deform, well, not, op, not automatically torsion, but it might be torsion value deformation invariant that sees beyond the elliptic index. So I'll stop here.